Hello and a very warm welcome to our DGAP, DJP morning briefing on geopolitical challenges. My name is Gunther Wolf and I'm the director of the German Council on Foreign Relations. And today we want to talk about uh, the implications of the Zeitenwende or the change of epochs um, for um, European integration. And we have really a stellar uh, lineup today um, with, uh, I would say, three very different but very complementary perspectives. Um, and I guess I will also say a few words and react to what we hear. So we will have actually four different perspectives. Uh, we will first um, hear from Shaheen Bale, who is a senior fellow at, uh, at the German Council. He will talk about um, uh, essentially uh, some of the debates around um, fiscal enlargement and even some of the military discussions between France, uh, France and Germany that are currently happening. Then I thought to bring in um, Alicia Garcia Herrero, who is actually a senior fellow at uh, Bruegel, um, my former shop, and um, uh, also, um, of course, the chief economist for Natixix, uh, and she sits in Taiwan, in Taipei, um, and is really a China expert, um, but of course, um, also a European expert, having worked in various European institutions, including in the European Central Bank for many years. And so, so I really look forward, uh, Alicia, also to your perspectives. And then last but not least, we want to hear from... Uh, Slavomir Sierakovsky. Uh, Slavik is a senior fellow at uh, the German Council um, and is from Poland. And um, I think will give us again a very complementary perspective on where he sees um, European integration at this stage and what uh, I think also Poland thinks of uh, Germany's position on, on some of these issues. So we will have French views on Germany's position, uh, Polish views um, and Chinese European international views, I would say. All right, so so uh, that's the plan for today. And of course, then we want to discuss with you. Um, well, let's start with you, Shaheen. Over to you. Thank you uh, very much, Guntram, and good morning to all. Uh, e even though I'm French, I, I don't think my views are exactly French, uh, um, but, um, but, you, but you will see that. My quick take of the moment um, is that the site and vendor or, and the, the war in Ukraine more generally has, uh, has actually opened a window uh, for European integration. And that when we look back at this moment uh, 10 years from now, we will realize uh, that it was the moment where a number of breakthroughs uh, have happened. I think these breakthroughs are still ha hard to, to, to see with naked eyes, but I think history will, will help us make these more, uh, more clear. Um, and, you know, I think we can start these changes with the big speech by Chancellor Scholz on February 26. But I think since then, there has been a number of other important steps that I think have made uh, the notion of site and vendor maybe a bit more uh, concrete and maybe in areas that are less obvious than what we thought and that are not uh, very directly uh, related to, to military uh, and defense integration. Uh, I think one important element in that uh, direction was the speech pronounced by, um, by President Macron uh, in, in May of 2022, where he announced uh, or made the call for the creation of a European political community, which was basically uh, organized uh, a further European uh, enlargement, but would also create an outer layer of integration to the European Union that would allow countries that are either um, in accession process or that are going to be in accession process or countries that may very well never be uh, inside the accession process but should still be part of some level of, uh, of integration with the European continent and that's the case of the UK of course but that also may be the case of countries further out uh, like uh, Azerbaijan, uh, Armenia, or even uh, Turkey, even though Turkey is in the special situation of being part of the accession process, 
but without clear perspective for EU um, uh, accession. So I think this was a very important moment, also because it articulated the need for European enlargement uh, with the necessity of European deepening. And by that, I mean the need for clear democratic and institutional reforms of the EU, recognizing that the EU as it operates today could not operate with you know, 10 more member states uh, uh, as it is uh, today. And so I think that speech was a very important opening. The reaction to the speech in Europe was not particularly warm. Um, uh, you've had actually a number of, uh, of countries uh, issuing uh, non-papers after that, rejecting the idea that we should have deep institutional and therefore treaty reforms. Uh, but then I think that speech was met by an important speech by uh, Chancellor Scholz at the end of August pronounced in Prague, which I think did two uh, or three very important things. One was uh, to recognize and to make a big concession to what was historically a French view, which was the notion that um, Europe uh, indeed uh, would need to deepen, uh, meaning to go through deep institutional reforms and treaty changes before it could enlarge. And this was a very important concession because until then the German position had been that uh, enlargement and deepening could be two processes that evolve in parallel tracks. I think the concession that Chancellor Schultz made was that actually that uh, uh, deepening could and should happen uh, before enlargement. And so that gave somewhat of a timeline for, for deepening, which basically meant, you know, we need to have treaty reforms in the next five to 10 years uh, if we want to have Ukraine uh, joining the EU uh, after that. Um, and, 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 and two, uh, Chancellor Scholz made a very important uh, comment, basically su suggesting what could be the terms of a compromise and a deal between France and Germany to actually accept this institutional reform. And the deal, as he put it out, was basically France uh, should accept that qualified majority on foreign policy uh, should be the way forward. Um, and in return, uh, Germany would accept that uh, qualified majority on tax issues uh, uh, would be accepted. You know, basically both a big French and a big German concession. My read of, of, uh, of uh, Chancellor Scholz's uh, comment, uh, which is probably an expensive read, is that he actually wrote um, um, qualified majority on tax, but we should read it as tax, qualified majority on, on tax and fiscal affairs, even though that's not the word that he, that he used. Uh, and there hasn't been really a, a response to this speech by, uh, by, by, by Chancellor Scholz in, in, at the end of August. And I think there hasn't been because we are at the moment of also intense Franco-German tension, which might uh, come in the way uh, of, of this leap in integration that, I, that I'm hoping uh, and that I think will come about. And I think these Franco-German tensions uh, come in uh, many shapes and form, but they have particularly crystallized on two issues that I think will need to be addressed if we want to have uh, this uh, big leap in European integration. One is on defense where I think the Seitenwender speech by uh, Scholz was uh, heard in Paris as a great opportunity to progress on strategic autonomy on, or, or on European sovereignty, as, as the French call it, and to make real progress in, in European defense capacity. And on this, since February, there's been a lot of disappointment because basically on the sort of three or four big cooperation projects on defense between France and Germany, there has been virtually no progress, if not actually setbacks on the big, you know, plan to build a common um, uh, future combat aircraft between France and Germany. There has been no progress whatsoever. In fact, Germany has placed an order for F-35 jets, which is uh, been very traumatic for the French um, on the plan to build a common uh, uh, tank for the future. Uh, there has been the announcement by Ryan Metal that uh, of a new of a new model tank built built only by Germany, which has uh, been seen as a as a real challenge to the Franco-German project in Paris. And on two maybe less important projects, the, the commitment to buy uh, uh, combat helicopter, helicopters between France and Germany to 
uh, to Airbus, um, uh, you know, Germany has walked back and, especially, and effectively bought uh, Apache helicopters from the US. And the same, there was a joint project signed in 2018 to buy a reconnaissance aircraft between France and Germany. And, and, and in fact, Germany decided to buy Boeing aircraft. So basically on, on defense, even though Zeiten vendor uh, sounded like an opportunity to go uh, deeper in, in, in Franco-German and European defense integration, there has been uh, uh, very little, if, if, if not nothing. And then on energy, uh, which you could have thought, you know, would be the moment of a great of a breakthrough between <clears throat> France and Germany as well, because of the of, of the war in Ukraine and because of the energy crisis. There has been virtually no no progress as well. In fact, France is doubling down on its uh, nuclear strategy, okay. and uh, Germany is doubling down on its renewable plus uh, gas, which you know won't be Russian gas at least in the short term, and will be uh, liquefied natural gas. But basically, there hasn't been a breakthrough in, in European energy cooperation. In particular, there was acute tension on the idea of building a pipeline between Spain and, and, and France, which, um, which Germany supported and which France, France, at least for the longest time, rejected until it proposed another compromise. So basically, on these two issues, which are quite critical um, uh, to, uh, to European integration, uh, there has been no Franco-German progress, and now you have a third coming on the table, which is the issue of fiscal rules, which is also one area where there doesn't seem to be uh, a great convergence of minds between France and Germany. So right. to conclude, I think we are at a moment of, of, of great potential, but great unrealized potential, uh, and I think this unrealized potential now holds on to what France and Germany can, can agree to in the next few months. And sorry, I've been a bit right. wrong. Limited. No, no, that that's, that uh, that was perfect. Thanks, Shaheen. And um, sort of, I I started thinking, oh my God, you are really optimistic, but you ended actually uh, quite uh, quite pessimistic, if I if I can phrase it uh, so. I mean, it seems to me um, that beyond sort of the the, the, the big standing speeches, um, the tensions between France and Germany over these concrete three topics, um, European fiscal integration, um, uh, military cooperation, as well as energy, um, are as deep as they always have been. And um, that comes at a moment where, um, of course, the natural response to um, the greater geopolitical tensions uh, is and what should be um, more European cooperation, more concrete European cooperation to be actually a, an effective player. I think from the outside, and we will hear from, from Alicia how this is seen, I guess, in Asia. From the outside, it still looks to me um, at least um, uh, as as if as if we are not at all making the kind of progress that we need to become a serious um, geopolitical player. On the contrary, I mean we are we are actually bogged down in our in our small debates um, uh, at a moment of actually quite 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 big urgencies. Uh, and I mean, if we take the, the topic Ukraine very specifically, I mean there's there's clearly no European leadership on. Uh, on Ukraine, it is really um, Germany very much following the U.S. lead uh, here. Um, but but let's see let's see what um, Alicia has to say. Well, uh, first of all, thanks for the invite. It's a pleasure to be here. I hope you can hear me well, uh, loud and clear. I'm going to be hopefully clear on the point that Guntram already race, which is that from this part of the world, uh, Europe looks um, very slow for the challenges ahead uh, still today, no matter the fact that we ourselves may feel that we've sp speeded up in many topics. But uh, in terms of how things are perceived here, that it doesn't percolate uh, for the moment. And let me explain you why. I think the first reason is that this part of the world is, is in, in a humongous transformation. And I'll go back to that in a minute. And the site then that we're talking about here, partially, at least my reading of them, are actually a consequence of what's happening here. So in a way, I would start by saying that how much of what we're doing is a reaction 
to how the world is changing. And I'm going to basically explore that uh, possibility. And the, the second reason why, uh, as I said, one is that possibly, you know, we are just reacting to, to what we are seeing. But the other thing is that um, the reaction is perceived as very small because the changes here are very big. I mean, it, it's a question of, 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 of uh, relative size. So let me, let me go back to what's happening in this part of the world, how it affects Europe. So the, the first thing I'd like to say is that there's two main uh, structural changes that, that I think have only accelerated uh, with the rise of China uh, and uh, basically the increase in share of the emerging world in, in global economic growth. And the first one is uh, geopolitical, or if you, if you want to say hard soft power, and the other one is economic. Uh, on the first one, I think that just a few, three key, maybe I will add a fourth one, which is more military or at least security wise, but basically you have the Global Development Initiative uh, announced in 2021 by Xi Jinping, which is very important to understand this this side bend. I mean, it's no longer about China versus the U.S. It's China bringing many other countries uh, to its economic and political model, and 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 the U.S. and where are we? <laughs> kind of, like, I mean, are we with the U.S. Are we not? And this brings us to the the spat with you know in our transatlantic alliance that we are going through at the moment. The other one is the community of common destiny for mankind. This is even more, um, I would say, uh, th this this has been in existence since 2018. I mean, Xi Jinping has been coming back to this concept for a long time. For some, it's been kind of, a, uh, it's become just a new, I mean, like the origin of the Global Development Initiative, but I think it's, it's a little bit different because this former concept is all about values, about basically Asian values, Confucian values being brought beyond China's borders. So here we're talking about not only, you know, um, helping other countries develop or, or follow the same economic or, or uh, basically economic strategy, we're talking about a society, society, societal changes and i think we are missing uh, probably this this uh, important uh change that is happening in this part of the world basically becoming much more disentangled or or, or further away from from western values and and this have to me started very clearly since 2018 as i mentioned the third which I would put together with the fourth is about security. So the Global Security Initiative again announced in 2022, which links to then uh, the reinforcement of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, uh, with new uh, observers uh, since the meeting in summer, uh, Samarkand on, only a few weeks before the Chinese Party Congress. So. I, I think this is just another important factor that that we can't forget that the, this this uh, organization is growing, and and this this is for us. I mean, for them is is basically uh, pointing to our increasing uh, smaller size in whether it's econ the economy. Uh, the, the the weight of our values or the security. And for us, I don't know what it means, but if you know, from my perspective, sitting here is like, if we see that, what should we do? Well, we, we should find uh, ways to respond, whether it's internally, and this is what uh, Shaheen basically covered, more integration, more integration. I'll go back to that in, in a minute, but also externally, transatlantic alliance. And, and I think this is very important, uh, kind of a, a you know middle power type uh, alliances whether it's South Korea, Japan, Australia, you name it. So 
on top of that, uh, as I said, there's two things I wanted to tackle. One is indeed this, this um, security values and uh, global development initiative put together, so soft hard power, but then also the economy. I think uh, within this side vendor, I think two things have happened that are important coming from Asia. Others are coming from the fact that we have inflation, and I won't talk about that, but they basically a massive increase in the cost of funding. But from Asia, what we are having is a much more important role of industrial policy, which, by the way, happens to be totally intertwined with trade policy. And therefore, industrial policy in a country X, say China, not only has consequences for that market and the companies, say, from Europe that operate in that market, but much more importantly, for our for third markets or even our single market, yeah, through trade or foreign direct investment or simply global competition. So I think this is something that that is going to have enormous consequences. It's already having enormous consequences for us, whether it's the Chips Act or many others. So to conclude, I think we need to find. Uh, that additional integration that Shahin was calling for. I totally agree with that. There's no way we can cope with these massive um, changes uh, of basically much more um, resurgent, as we say in this uh, project we are conducting for the Commission on China, resurgent uh, economies or economy leading many others to come along in that resurgence. Uh, there is, there is really no way out than, than additional integration, whether it's deeper and Shahin uh -huh. went through, uh, through that, or even larger, meaning you know uh, accession or, or other forms of cooperation, all the way, as I said, to to um, middle power, uh, especially Asian powers, to bring along uh, some kind of some 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 hedging from, from these enormous uh, changes that we're experiencing in this part of the world. So that's all from my side. Thank you. Wonderful, Alicia, and thank you for, for bringing that out very clearly. I mean, the one point, I guess, where I, I do want to use the opportunity to just ask you very directly is, of course, um, the, recent, the recent protests um, in China itself. I mean, you you talked about the Asian values being more and more um, also exported, um, but what we seem to be seeing in China is at least um, some longing for personal liberties again and, and freedom. Uh, can, can you just give us a sort of really 20 seconds, Max, your take yes. on, on what's happening? Okay, so in 20 seconds, I can only say that I don't think these protests are so far uh, political, or at least in 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 not in 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 a major way. So I would not overread the protests. I think they're mostly uh, kind of minimum freedom type, or you know, so, a social contract type. Uh, uh, so the so Chinese giving up a lot of uh, freedom, but not so much as as requested now because of COVID restrictions, in exchange for welfare, yeah, for for wealth basically which they are not getting anymore, partially because of COVID, but not only. So that because the social contract is breaking, they're, they're asking for rebalancing, but they're not, in my opinion, putting yet to, you know, into full question their political model. And the reason is, to be frank, is that our model doesn't look too appealing to them now because Again, this is the whole idea of the West is in decline, the West is in decline, the West is in decline. And when they see the news and what's happening in, you know, and especially in Europe, I mean, they, they kind of hesitate to. So it's it's related to the point I made before. And I just right. to, to, to finish that, I don't think this will go very far protest wise mm -hmm. because China is opening up quickly and surely. And what well, may happen point. with lots of people out there, uh, elderly, I don't want to know, but I think they're, they're going to open up, yeah. Wonderful, and, and of course the narrative in China that the West is declining and China is on the rise is in itself worth to be challenged um, because the Chinese growth, growth model, of course, um, is also coming to uh, clear limits. Um, and uh, I, I tend to, 
uh, be firmly convinced that we are still overestimating the growth potential of China. China will have massive problems in the next decades. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm working on a, on a little piece uh, on, on exactly that, that question. Um, so, so the narrative in China will, will also look quite different in the next decades. Um, um, but uh, this is not what we want to discuss today. We want to further sort of dwell on what all of this means for European integration. And I want to bring in Slavic um, uh, to, to give us his perspective and perhaps give you sort of one question ahead. I mean, it seems to me that um, what Shaheen described is um, sort of that we are all very reactive. I mean, we are reacting to the situation, but um, what I, I do not sense is that as we are reacting, we are thinking what it uh, we are thinking about what all of the, these reactions mean for European integration. It seems as if European integration is an afterthought, even though we are in such a historic moment where Poland, for example, is increasing its military capacities uh, to unprecedented levels, Germany is rearming. I mean, these are very big changes, right? Uh, Poland might have the biggest landlocked um, army uh, in the continent. Um, and so, so, so these big changes are happening in reaction to external threats, but without really much thought for European integration. But perhaps I'm too pessimistic in my reading. Slavik, what's your take? So unlike China, Poland is on the rise uh, for sure, and uh, and it, but of course it's not an easy task to um, describe Polish foreign policy line. We have actually two lines because we have elections in autumn 2023, and there are completely different lines of, of foreign policy. So please keep it in mind. Uh, the, the 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 opposition in public polls has around 55, maybe even to 60 percent. So it's very probable that we will change our our um, agenda pretty soon and radically. Um, about 70 percent of Polish media and public opinion, which of course has some influence um, and is a kind of an indicator what can happen pretty much soon is still free and liberal up to 70 percent so we have kind of a very radical political conflict and a huge discrepancy between two visions of european integration or eastern policy or whatever global challenges between the opposition and the ruling party. As for the ruling party, it's hard to even call it the foreign policy line because uh, for the leader, and it's a very specific leader, unlike Viktor Orban, who travels, who has some ambitions even to change European Union, Jaroslav Kaczynski doesn't travel and has only one request, don't bother us and we won't bother you. Uh, so he has no ambition to change anything outside of Poland. Um, um, and European Union integration is especially for this government, but here the Polish this Polish government is not an exception. The transatlantic um, relations or the I would even say that the dream of Poland is, to just become one day the 51st state of the United States. So as you see, European integration is not the, the, the what they are thinking about, like mostly. They are thinking about, especially when it comes also to this, to this strange arms race that we observe, not between Germany and France, but also between Poland and anybody else pretty much in, the, in Europe um so so but so so more, more or less but but on the other hand opposition actually would just join what shaheen described as um something that it's partly integration partly uh, partly competition between france and germany but for for the opposition for people like donald tusk 
Poland to become the third engine and to 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 take part in some joint projects uh, um, in energy policy, in defense policy, in any uh, common policy would be uh, would be of course uh, something that they are willing to do. As for European integration, first, what comes to 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 our minds here is, of course, the is in integration of Ukraine, um, uh, rather than integration of Balkans or anything else. And probably a deepening European integration would be something that the opposition is willing to 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 take part in. So, like these two both processes that Shahin described are on the agenda of, of, of Polish opposition. But Polish government to interpret is really quite a challenge. Uh, as, I, as I said, the, 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 uh, even when I read what the Polish new ambassador in Germany was like, what is his perception on, or declarations is, still that the historical policy for Gangens Heights policy is number one and then everything depends on this so in, when it comes to Poland and Germany there is a question of reparation or compensation for the second world war atrocities um, um, when it comes to to more global politics there is still much bigger sentiment to the United States also in the ruling camp um, then to France or Germany, it comes from the legacy of solidarity from 80s, who, who really challenged the Soviet Union, uh, and 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 it is still remembered that that it's the United States and then UK, and then afterwards nobody, nobody, and then comes France or or Germany. So it 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 it, it it's important because when it comes to choosing from whom we will buy arms. Uh, still the, the the United States it's it's our first uh, address and then comes actually oh, not the country uh, not the country that uh, that is that like like the, the, our second best choice is who can sell us something first and here comes the South Korea because we are looking on what is on the shelf and when Poland is uh, observing the discussions in, in Germany or in France about uh, creating the new town, creating the common, you know, the new Eurofighters, uh, there are big doubts here, actually, on any side, that it can be realized ever or soon. This is why Poland is signing uh, almost every day a uh, new contract uh, either with the, the United States or the South Korea. And it's true, uh, up, I believe that 2025, 2026, we will have more than 1,000 tanks. Um, uh, we will have around new um, 32 um, F-35 from the United States, but around 18 jets from the South Korea, more light jets, but also more sophisticated jets. And plus more and plus, of course, the anti-defense missile system. Unfortunately, Poland did not join the initiative of 14 countries, Finland plus 13 NATO members to build kind of an iron dome for the EU and for and, but with, and this is something that uh, the opposition would like to change so for the opposition to join this initiative as a priority so, somehow to to make it complementary to what we are building in cooperation with the United States um, so this <laughs> is this is this is one thing as for the European integration for Poland, it, it it's everything is about the recovery fund and European funds. I mean, for the for for the government, so it's about money. Plus, it's a kind of a tricky game when the government would like to either to wow. bribe bribe the Western Europe. That means we can, uh, well, if you know, stop blocking uh, funds for Poland, and we can rethink our 
agenda from whom we would we would like to buy weapon so this is what this is one policy which is stupid because nobody would believe it uh but mm. this is not the only stupid thing that the government is doing they are doing around 1000 stupid things every day mm. Mm. and then and then there is also some kind of moral game uh we welcomed millions of refugees so you should stop isolating us you should uh you should stop suspending funds etc cetera, etc cetera. and again it doesn't work as well at, up to, up to now i well um this is right. it concerning titan vendor uh, i would say that we have three kind of reactions first of all it was pretty much undermined um by the i would say uh i would call it german uh now Germans indolence in the first months after Titan Vendor uh in helping Ukraine now I I know that it's changing um but like the first impression about Titan Vendor and some kind of trust to that the, the project is real and it will happen for real was was pretty much undermined uh in in the first months but having said that i would say that that still you have three kind of reactions one is waiting and some doubts as i said yeah um, and this, then the second is satisfaction uh by that i i understand two things one uh is that implementation of Scholz plan in, increases poland's security so the opposition is happy about it or would be happy about it and the second thing is of course about the issues of like we were right now you are telling that we were right so we have this yeah. kind of this kind of that's uh, uh, okay um th thank you so much slavic um i mean i i did want to ask you one uh, one point or uh, sort of raise that point a bit more explicitly which was of course the recent uh, patriot decision um so germany ready to uh, to deliver patriot um defense system to uh, to poland poland first seeming to want to agree uh, to want to take it and and then uh, then rejecting um, I mean, my reading is that for domestic electoral reasons, um, uh, Kaczynski is ready to actually um, sacrifice um, or reduce the security of, of his own country um, to be able to um, uh, sort of continue with an anti-German German narrative, which is, of course, um, uh, huge and uh, any reaction you would have to that how that also goes down in the Polish domestic debate would be interesting and I do want to bring in Shaheen um, also on this um, this air defense and missile defense question where um, again there's also Franco-German um, disagreement with Germany actually uh, forging ahead now but with systems that are not not french made and so that has raised a lot of concerns um in in france and i know that alicia also wanted to raise a, a question or a comment and perhaps alicia you want to uh, you want to raise that comment and then we really want to come to questions we are already over time actually so so you have to be extremely concise so, so let me just add one more question from the chat already so that our audience also has a, has a chance. I mean, one, one question from the audience, which I think is, is to Shaheen, is really about the fact that um, uh, this is not about a treaty reform, but it's really about a political willingness to upgrade the common European interest um, ahead of um, short-term national um, sovereignty um, concerns. Both Germany and France lack this political willingness. That is a question from Tanya Tanya Bertzel, and perhaps you want to want to respond to that as well. So, so Alicia and then uh, Shaheen and then Slavic, please always very concise. Alicia, I'll be very very concise, uh, uh, and I am obviously not in this European you know, uh, discussion because otherwise I wouldn't be so shocked. But I am shocked. Um, uh, so, Slavomir, could you really uh, clarify whether what you said about 
Poland's point of view about you know preferences uh, refers to the current government or it's really like a structural issue because if that's the case then the question is what is Poland doing in the EU I mean sorry to be so frank but I don't understand how this is sustainable and I want to link it to what I said at the beginning given the challenges we have ahead I'm telling you from this part of the world where you're saying only reflects what here is thought about us if you see what I mean like like this totally you know uh, um, disintegrating type of uh, reality so so could you clarify yeah wonderful Shaheen and then Slavik Uh, yeah, no, I had a similar question to that, Alicia. I think it's very important to understand the extent to which uh, what we see in Poland today is um, is uh, structural or related to the current government. And I think Slavomir answered for parts of it. So, you know, he made it clear that for the European Sky Shield, so the German anti-ballistic missile uh, initiative, this is something that the opposition might want to rejoin, but it's not clear for the rest. So I think it would be interesting to hear him on, on that. Um, and, and yes, for the, the anti-ballistic uh, program announced by, uh, by Germany in October, um, you know, I think the issue is twofold. Not only that this relies on Israeli and American technology when France and Italy were, were building uh, a European technology to, to do something similar, but also the fact that the cooperation project as proposed by Germany to 14 other countries basically does not include France in the coverage and does not include any countries of, uh, of Southern Europe. So instead of building a pan-European military uh, air defense uh, response, what Germany has proposed is to essentially uh, build something around, or, or at least this is how it is perceived, to build something around Germany's uh, sphere of influence. And I think this has gone down in, uh, in France as a, real, as a real shock, not only because uh, you know, it, 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 it is not based on, on European industrial capacity, but also because it would basically create a partition inside sort of the, uh, the European defense uh, uh, shield and I, and I think that's that's uh, that's problematic. And answering the question that was asked about treaty change, yes, you're right. You know, I mean, the, uh, you know, it's first and foremost uh, putting European interest politically ahead of national interest, and that's 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 a big ask to uh, uh, national uh, governments. But ultimately, that's why I insisted on the institutional dimension and the treaty change. I think the, the way you crystallize uh, that recognition is uh, in the form of a treaty change. And so, you know, I think the notion that you can do that without treaty change is, is often used. And I think that's true, but I think there are also limits to what you can achieve without treaty reforms. And uh, I think the person asking was a German citizen. Uh, the German constitutional court uh, reminds us very often that there are limits to what we can do without treaty reforms. And that we've been actually over the last 10 years stretching very far uh, what we can do with the current uh, treaties and, and even sometimes going beyond what the current treaties allow. And I think there comes a time where we need to align what we do from a political and policy standpoint with what our primary law at the European level allows. And I think this time has come and this is something that should be undertaken in the next European Parliament after 2024. And this is something that will raise very profound questions in our uh, 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 you know, in our friends in Eastern Europe and in Poland in particular. Right. Um, so, so I think Sla uh, Slavik, you are the next, but let me just add the question here by, by James Willey um, in the chat. Um, and then afterwards we, we go to uh, those that raise the hand. Um, um, so, so, so James is asking, well, surely the way ahead for deeper European defense cooperation is we are uh, uh, the cooperative um, NATO alliance and not via integrative EU. Um, the, the defense spend of the UK, France, Germany, and Poland exceed that of Russia. Even if NATO ceased to exist, a coalition of these European states should be very able to deter any 
uh, uh, threats to the security of the liberal democratic European space. So, so do we go European or do we go NATO here, um, Slavic? Okay, to, we, <laughs> have, we have two countries here uh, and two societies and one is running embarrassing foreign policy or no foreign policy. I'm sorry for that. I would love to have a different government, but we have the one we have. It shouldn't be such a big surprise for you uh, if you remember Brexit or Donald Trump or Viktor Orban or your own populist parties um, in France and, and, and Germany and other countries. But don't forget, uh, each time majority uh, is, of, is against it. Uh, the problem is motivation. Peace is winning elections with motivation. Peace is like the Red Army, okay? They, if they fight, they really fight. But they have never majority. So you, from this point of view, Poland is pretty much a uh, normal country. And the second Poland would be the best student in class when it comes to European integration, common defense policy. So it's a question of, I hope, time uh or just a question of who rules um poland as you remember donald tusk donald tusk was the, the the biggest fan of european integration um everybody here like radek sikorski and other leaders of political opposition are talking about joining uh the sky shield european sky shield project and probably but all but you know united states will have priority here no matter what and for good reasons because if you look how german army looks today or how how long and realistic are plans to build the new projects uh in France or Germany, or even if you take these four countries that, that 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 were mentioned in the question, whether they can be so determined to to defend Ukraine, that means for both and Poland, uh, it's a pretty much question mark if you re, if you live in this part of of, of Europe. So United States, then even then UK. Uh, looks like much more consistent uh, ally, uh, but 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 this question would wouldn't exist anyway for the opposition because the opposition would stand on two legs, and would be not that much bothering. Um, pretty much, this is it. All right, so let's take some questions from, from the floor. Um, I see Philip Hirsemenzel, um, and please raise your, 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 um, your hand in the, uh, in the tool so that I can give you the floor. Philip, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm an analyst and author in the, in the clean energy space. And um, so my, uh, in view of, I don't know if you saw it, Robert Harvick's uh, a big industrial policy speech yesterday, and um, uh, the entire um, um, sudden wake up to what the Inflation Reduction Act uh, means for transatlantic trade. Um, I would be interested um, in, in your view of how we can actually achieve or what needs to change so that we can um, come to that sort of industrial uh, um, reignition and especially reshore the entire clean energy value chain uh, in view of our 95% strategic dependence on China for all of this, not only solar panels, basically all of it. And, um, and, and what role, um, and, and for that we need an, I, I strongly believe, but I don't think I'm the only one that we need an Airbus moment, but actually Air, Airbus on steroids, right? And um, uh, Airbus with exponential growth. And, um, how can we achieve that and what needs to change that Germany and France come to an agreement and how can we bring in Poland? I mean, Poland does play an important part already because a large part of the, the battery production uh, that has been reshored to Europe by the, uh, uh, is actually in Poland. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much. Um, this is really uh, also a question that's dear to, to our heart. And I've been discuss discussing that just, just two days ago with Shaheen at, at some length. And I think what is quite um, interesting is that the US Inflation Reduction Act foresees uh, 369 billion US dollars over the next 10 years for essentially um, energy security and, and climate measures. Now that that is a lot of money, and um, it is poured into um, uh, technology. Um, there's, for example, quite a big chunk uh, for uh, for green green hydrogen, and so that's clearly industrial policy. Now the question is, what is the European response? Um, and I would say Europe um, has has so far had two main elements of its response to. Uh, to, to the climate change challenge. Uh, one was, um, uh, of course, the pricing of emissions. So uh, internalizing the externalities, so the emission trading system, but also effort sharing regulation and others. So there's a clear sort of price signal that incentivizes um, uh, climate, uh, climate measures. Now, what I, I miss some somewhat now in this debate is the fact that we have a second element, which is the recovery, uh, the recovery fund after the, the COVID recession, which actually um, is an 800 billion uh, vehicle, um, also over five years, actually only, um, for, of which actually 40% um, is dedicated to, to green. Now, it's probably less dedicated to technology um, and more to sort of basic infrastructure spending. Um, but it is clearly green spending by the government, right? Um, by the government sector. And so, so I guess I wanna bring in Shaheen to understand a bit more this, this gap between I would say um, the money, I mean, the money that is, is there is actually quite significant, the, the, the commission money for green, and it's especially in countries uh, of, of the South and the East of Europe, um, the, there's really significant funding um, available over the next two, three years still, but it's certainly not sort of in, in cutting edge, uh, building the cutting edge new technologies. But, but Shane, perhaps I'm, um, yeah. Give me your take. No, I, I think it's very difficult <clears throat> to have a clear view um, and, and compare these amounts because the 300 and, and uh, let's call them 50 billion from the IRA is pure tax credits, while the numbers we're talking about for, for Europe and that you, you're referring to uh, a Guntram or a combination of grants and loans. So, it, you know, we, we, I don't think we can, we can compare these nominal amounts one, one, one for one. Um, really, I think they have a very different multiplier when it comes to, to the effect they have on, on, on the industry. Uh, but I think it's, it's true to say that uh, it's not like Europe hasn't done anything to subsidize uh, uh, green uh, and renewables over the last decade. You've had a number of national um, uh, subsidy schemes, whether it be for electric vehicles, uh, and others pretty mm -hmm. much across Europe uh, for the development of renewables that's very clear in Germany in particular. So, you know, I think there is a, a bit of a reaction in the, on the part of, of, of Europe that doesn't take into account all the things that Europe at the EU level as well as uh, at the member state level has done. Now, there is still, I think, a big question, um, you know, how do we respond to the IRA? And I think there aren't uh, 20 options here. Uh, one is the French option, which is basically to do a bi European act. So basically to kind of break down uh, uh, trade flows and, 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 and impose a strong European preference for a certain number of goods. If we're honest about this, if we do this today, given the state of our industrial capacity in renewables, that means substantial delays in the ramp up of renewables uh, in Europe. I mean, we don't have in Europe the industrial capacity to provide all the wind turbines, all the solar panels, all the hydrogen electrolyzers that we uh, need. And in fact, we are going to purchase that from China. That's the plan. And that's basically the only way to meet our renewables uh, targets today. 
uh, I think, uh, you know, saying otherwise is probably uh, disingenuous. So, you know, so I see the merit of the Bi-European Act, but I also don't see how that squares with our, um, uh, with our environmental uh, uh, objectives in, in the medium term. The other option is to try and play tit for tat and basically uh, do a subsidies race uh, with the US. Uh, and I think if we do that, we have two questions. One is, do we do this at the European level, which raises the question of common uh, European resources to launch a subsidies race? Uh, or do we do this at the national level, in which case we have a potential breakdown of the single market if we don't find the, the cooperation framework or the guidelines to do these uh, at, at, at the, at, at, um, in, a for, in a rather coordinated way. Okay. And last, we have the option to basically be um, uh, rather passive and fight it off at the WTO, but that means we don't get any results before two to three years, and that probably comes at a very substantial cost to the European industrial base in the meantime. So. We don't have a lot of, uh, of, of options, I, I, I fear, uh, but I think we, before jumping uh, to our guns, we will probably also need to make a proper assessment of what is the sum of subsidies undertaken at the EU and, and at the national level already. And I think if we do that, we'll probably realize that yes, um, the US has done something pretty major but I don't think comparing the 369 to nothing uh, is, is the right way of looking at it. Exactly. Wonderful. Okay, so, so very quickly, we have six minutes left. We have Milan and Milan Nietzsche and Peter Linke. And um, I think um, I don't see any other questions. So we take those two and then conclude. Milan. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, two quick points. Um, the first one is coming back to your discussion and uh, Slavic, what you said about um, Poland's uh, rejection of uh, offer of Patriots uh, on air defense um, capabilities from Germany. I just want to make a point that Poland is an exception um, in this sense in uh, Central Eastern Europe. My own country, Slovakia, was very grateful to Germany for providing exactly the same. So uh, Patriot, Pateri together with uh, with Netherlands. And here, I would say that Germany tried, it was a nice move, but it was also very interesting to follow Poland's reaction from the positive one by Minister of Defense Blaszczak first day, and then being overruled by Kaczynski the day after. It's domestic politics, Poland power is, in, is everything. and. We will have a Polish exception for one more year on, on many things as there is a shift of, 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 um, of um, gravity um, inside the EU on the East. But Poland will concentrate on domestic fights. Second um, issue is Poland and Hungary currently are the only countries that are not benefiting from the recovery funds as they are going through a very difficult domestic economic uh, crisis. And uh, we will see... Um, what happens in two weeks when there is a vote in, um, perhaps a vote in, in the council over the proposed um, uh, measures by the commission to freeze some funds um, for Hungary, what will be Poland's reactions? Uh, while in the same package, there is a, a breakthrough on the recovery fund that the commission will uh, suggest to approve the recovery fund. So it's much this, this, this uh, Hungary, Poland, Dynamics will be very interesting to watch uh, over the next few weeks, also because Hungary is vetoing um, uh, joint borrowing to Ukraine, which Poland, of course, it's uh, not very pleased with. It. Thanks. Uh, Thanks I, I, I wonder if Slavic has something to, the, yeah, yeah. to tell okay. this within the li limited time we have. Yeah. Thanks, Milan. Uh, Peter Linke. Uh, this is, uh, this is a question for uh, our uh, Asian participant, Ms. Herrero. Um, from your perspective, from your Asian perspective, how do you assess uh, developments um, or um, how um, developments in Europe, in Ukraine, uh, impacted uh, uh, China uh, Central Asian relations? Is there any new um movement between china and uh, and central asia especially between kazakhstan and central uh, and uh, china 
or uh, not. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Alicia and Slavic, and then we conclude. Yeah, I'll be brief because there is very little time, but we can take it offline. Uh, my sense is that China is filling the void that Russia is uh, somehow reluctantly living in the region. Uh, the uh, Xi Jinping's trip to Kazakhstan, Samarkand later uh, is very uh, obvious as you know as a signal that the region is very important for China and that the relation between China and Russia is that of a you know, big and small brother. It's very, very obvious by now. Uh, we had also Modi and, and Putin, and you, know, uh, you can see that Putin is aware of this and is trying to find other sources of, of not so much exports, because that's not the problem, it's imports yeah, of, of key components. And, and I think you can see that in a way, this this trapping feeling uh, by looking at what's happening in Central Asia. So I think it's it's a very very um, <laughs> and I don't know whether unfortunate or fortunately, but a success for for China in this part of the world. Very clearly, they they're filling that gap uh, very quickly. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks, uh, Slavic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Two points. One is that. Um, it's a per paranoia of one man, Jarosław Kaczyński, that actually this paranoia is not even anti-German paranoia, that it's not even very much present in not only everywhere or in in, in, in the society. It's, it's I would say, um, it's just absent. Nobody really here has any problem with, with Germany. Not even Polish president or prime minister. Uh, Kaczynski used to have, for some personal reasons, actually nobody really knows what is going on with his relation to Germany. But this is this is it. So the question of patriot was determined by what Kaczynski thinks about Germany. And you know, I can give you some quotations from Kaczynski. Like from 2014, he he already said, German NATO troops in Poland at least seven generations must pass before this is acceptable. And then every day on the part attacks of peace, he's saying something um, about Germany, which is pretty much uh, like another example. The European Union is the mask of Germany. Brussels is the mask of Berlin, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, this is the way how he's dealing with the, with the problem and with patriots, which of course it's anti-Polish pretty much defense policy. The second point, as for recovery fund, there is little progress uh, because some, some judges uh, that were suspended, and this was this one of the milestones uh, determined by the by Brussels, some of them are not suspended anymore. But 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 the the other milestones I won't change uh anytime soon so i don't think that poland i i would even say that the government is pretty much prepared well not really economically but like mentally that the the, the funds will not be here uh until 2023 i'm sorry okay Okay, I'm afraid we have come to the end. I see that Thomas O'Donnell has raised the hand, but we have come to the end of our hour. Um, but, but Thomas, if you want to uh, uh, chat, uh, please just drop me a quick line and we can, we can discuss further. And thank you so much to uh, Alicia uh, Garcia Herrero for joining us today from, from Taipei. And of course, to my colleagues, Shaheen and, uh, and Slavic for, for joining me. And of course, thank you to all of you for uh, listening and commenting and participating so actively. Until next time, bye-bye.